Welcome to Casual Friday. Okay, and just like with Technique Tuesdays, there are probably a few links down in the description if you want to jump uh, back and forward through the podcast. So first thing I want to announce uh, an update to, I, I mentioned last week I have an article in the current uh, Internet Knitwear magazine on decoding lace uh, shaping. Uh, and what they tend to do is sometime after the magazine comes out, they'll often put the article in their blog and so that you can read the article um, at any time. Whenever you discover that the article exists, you can go to the blog and read it. So I'm going to leave a link down below to my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks, and the group has uh, various uh, tabs. It has something called pages and on the page, um, on the pages tab, you'll be able to find um, a particular page that lists all my articles by issue and date. And then if there is a link to uh, the blog post, to a blog post that has that article, it's in there. And if there isn't a, a blog post that has that article, at least you'll be able to see what issue it was. And you can buy the magazine in digital format if you want to do that, if you want to buy the entire magazine. And you could get the article that way if there isn't a link to a blog post. So I'll leave that a link to uh, the group uh, down below and you should be able to get to those article links from there. I started my Latvian mitten class on Saturday and it was really fun. I was, I was, what I was hoping for was to get some insight into um, what the cultural importance or the cultural significance of these mittens were because when I went to the exhibit, um, I was kind of struck by how elaborate these mittens were and then the fact that different regions used different colors and had different sorts of designs. And I was really intrigued by that. So I wanted to learn a little bit more. So my focus has always been more on texture patterns. So I know a lot about things like uh, Aran knitting and Bavarian traveling twisted stitch patterns and, and um, the, you know, how those sorts of things evolved. But I don't know a lot about color stranded work other than there's some easily identifiable visual differences between, say, what you'll see in Fair Isle patterns from the Shetland Islands, Swedish, uh, Norwegian, uh, Finnish, you know, Estonian, you know, there, there's some like obvious similarities and some differences, but I didn't really understand the significance of Latvian mittens to their culture. And so, because I didn't really need to take a class to learn how to knit uh, mittens, I re I was really hoping for for historical information or what makes a Latvian mitten a Latvian mitten versus some other kind of mitten, and I was not disappointed. The woman who uh, was teaching the class, she keeps saying, "Well, I'm not a knitter." I mean, she can knit obviously, and she has knit many Latvian mittens but she's primarily a weaver. So she wanted to make that clear <laughs> that she's like, I'm not a knitter. Um, so, but she introduced the class with this, this information about Latvian mittens that I, I, I just like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. In 18th, 19th century, girls were given a hope chest when they were small. And the idea was that um, they would learn various handcrafts and as they grew up and they would have to be filling up this hope chest so that when they got married, they would have all kinds of uh, things that they would need for their new home. But Latvian girls had to also, they had to knit like two to 300 pairs of mittens by the time they got married. So they were taught to knit when they were really little and they had to knit these mittens. And, and not only did they have to knit like two or 300 pairs of mittens, they couldn't be the same. I mean, the pair could be the same, but they had to all be different combinations of colors and patterns. You could, they couldn't be duplicated. And which just kind of blows my mind when I, when I think about the, the amount of 
work and creativity that would have to get poured into these mittens. What would happen when, when she reached marriageable age, let's say they went to a matchmaker or something and they were, a matchmaker was trying to set her up with this a young man. If she decided she liked him and would be interested in marrying him, she would present him with one of these pairs of mittens, which he would accept. Um, he, he may or may not accept her proposal of marriage, but he would accept the mittens. But that was considered an engage, you know, like a, that was considered an engagement present and, and that, you know, if when he accepted the mittens, then they would be engaged. So that was the first pair of mittens. And then they'd go to the minister and they'd say, okay, we intend to get married. And she would give him the minister a pair of mittens. And then as the wedding date approached, they, you know, there's that old uh, tradition where they read, is that read the bands? something like that, where they, the three weeks, the three Sundays before a couple gets married, there's a reading of the bands. And so at each one of these, uh, each of these three weeks, she would again present the minister with another pair of mittens. And then on the wedding day, the minister would get another pair of mittens, but so would all of the, um, the members of the, of the family. So like, her in-laws would get them, her, the godparents, the, uh, the whole extended family. Every, anybody who came to the wedding, apparently, would get a pair of mittens. And whoever drove them to the wedding, like in the, the horse and, and wagon or cart or carriage or whatever it was that was taking them to the church, that person would get mittens, but so would the horses. The horses would get mittens. And then they, when they were moving like with her dowry, like she had cows or something like that. They'd be dangling uh, mittens from the cow's horns. And then in some areas, there was this tradition of tossing mittens into the yard um, before they went into the house. So there's like mittens like all over the countryside. Now these mittens didn't get worn very, these were like special mittens. So they didn't, you know, mittens that were gifts like this were special and they didn't get worn very often. So. And because there were just so many mittens, like every woman was producing hundreds of pairs of mittens, there are many, many examples of these mittens that are still preserved because they weren't worn, they were saved. So there's these museums all over Latvia that have um, these, these mittens, these elaborate mittens, and they can, it's a way to document what patterns were used in different regions and what colors were mostly used in in this region versus that region so it's um so it's an incredible thing so they so part of this the and the exhibition that latvian mitten exhibition i had thought was going to be gone by the time the class started and i was kind of disappointed because i thought it would be really nice to still have those mittens there when the class was there and but the mittens were still there they were still hanging there and so she could tell us about different things and like she said on the wedding day the bride would give the groom a pair of wedding gloves so they were white and so there was a pair of those gloves hanging from there and he had to wear them for the entire the entire day so they were eating and doing whatever and um and he had them on but his were his were gloves so because can you imagine trying to eat something with mittens but so that was all fa really fascinating. And then toward the end of the class, there was a, a woman who showed up with a camera and she was taking pictures and she was there to take the display down and then send it on. But she was showing a book that, that was traveling around with the display that was originally uh, written and print, uh, published in Latvian and now there's an English version. And so then I, I saw it and I um, came home and I ordered a copy. It just came, I think it came yesterday. So it's called, um, Mittens of Latvia. And what this is, is they collected, um, they went around to all these museums that had hundreds and hundreds of examples of mittens and they uh, photographed them and then they charted each mitten and then they re-knit them. I'm not clear on why they re-knit them, like why they didn't just, so maybe they wanted them to be perfect examples. I don't, I don't know. But so for example, here's one page where so let's see, over, over on this side we have the chart and then on this side they have the, the knitted mitten to show what it looks like. So on these charts they have at the bottom uh, something to help you count the number of stitches. <laughs> and I was looking at that because I thought these just seem so intricate and elaborate 
and obviously they're tiny stitches and we're you know we're knitting mittens at you know, like eight stitches an inch for this class so we have like 56 or 60 stitches something like that which is it's not a ton of stitches but it's a fair number for a pair of mittens and so I'm looking at these and these have like uh a lot of them have more than 50 stitches just for one half of the chart. So the mittens are over 100 stitches. So like close to twice of what I'm doing for my men. Like, okay, so that's why they can be so elaborate. Um, not all of them are that much. Some of them are just in the 40s, which means it's in the 80s. These 45, 45, 40, 45, 65 this pair so this pair of mittens is 130 stitches all the way around so just unbelievable so it's uh it's pretty amazing so my mitten <laughs> right now this is how far i've gotten on my mitten i made a mistake on i was knitting on it on sunday and i made a mistake and i got mad and i put it to the side and then i haven't had time to get back to it so i'm hoping um i have to make some progress in the next week and a half um, before the next class anyway. Oh, and then there's like 10, 10, 11 people in this class. And I would say maybe a third of the, well, there's like three or four women in the class who are Latvian, um, have Latvian ancestry. Either their parents or grandparents or great grandparents, somebody. They're probably, most of them grandparents immigrated to the United States. One of them, was talking about how her grandmother, when her grandmother got older, started knitting mittens again. Like she's just going crazy, knitting the mittens, knitting the mittens. And she's like, Grandma, why, why are you knitting so many mittens? She said, well, it's for my funeral. So apparently the women didn't just have to knit a ton of, of mittens for their wedding, but also for their funeral. And to give to all the people who were involved in, in, I guess, the pallbearers and the minister again and who knows who all. Uh, everybody was supposed to get mittens. And she made enough for everyone except two people. Um, and I said, well, did she have to knit them for her husband too? I'm like, no. I'm like, oh, so the men, the men, they die and that's it. But the women have to provide mittens to everyone. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, but I did, I did find it just so fascinating how important um, this particular item of clothing is to this culture. Like the Latvia is the size of West Virginia and they have about the same population, like two million people, maybe it's just under three million, somewhere around that. But the populations are very close as is the actual uh, size of the country. And it just blows my mind that there are distinct regions within that country that have very specific uh, ways that they made mittens. Um, and, you know, I asked, is it, is it a mountainous country? Like, is that why it's so, you know, narrowly focused? No, it's very flat, just like Minnesota. But I suppose, you know, even if it's flat, uh, getting from uh, one end of West Virginia to the other, or one end of Latvia to the other would be not something somebody in the 19th or 18th century would have done. So that makes sense. So it's the end of March and March, at least here in the United States, I don't think this is an international thing. I think it's just an American thing. It's the um, Women's History Month here. And this year, the theme is nevertheless, she persisted. And when I was reading about this last week, I thought, oh, you know, those Latvian women were really, really persistent and really determined to get um, these mittens done. And just how women can be persistent and determined in different ways, in different time periods, in different places, based on what's going on in their own families or in their, in their own culture. Um, so I thought I'd talk about two, two women or two families of women that I have found really interesting and who I have felt compelled to sort of document pretty thoroughly on my tree because they don't have any direct descendants. There's no great, great grandchildren to record what they did. And they were pretty, you know, they were historically significant in um, 
American history, if not world history. So I decided a few years ago, I, I had you know really been researching my direct line ancestors. I would take note of who their siblings were. Um, and I, I kind of knew who that was, but I decided that I really wanted to uh, re make note of exactly who their siblings were, when their siblings were born and died, and then who, who the siblings married, and then what their children's names were. I didn't want to do anything more with their children. I didn't want to keep coming forward in time. But it can be really useful to look at siblings because sometimes if you can't get past that generation, you don't know who the parents are, sometimes you can find a parent, a widowed parent, uh, or some other relative living in the household of a sibling. So you can really um, pick up a lot more information that way when you go sideways a little bit. So the first family is um, the Bassett family. The mother was Eunice Bacchus, and she married John Bassett. John was the brother of my fourth great grandfather. So the Bassett family has a very long history in the United States. William Bassett arrived here in 1621, just a year after the Mayflower arrived. He was supposed to, supposedly, he was supposed to be on um, the companion ship to the Mayflower. Originally, the Mayflower was a larger ship, was, was traveling with a majority of the passengers. And then there was a companion ship called the Speedwell, which was going to go to cross over with them. And then the Speedwell would stay for a year uh, and be able to be used by the pilgrims to explore up and down the coast or maybe used as a fishing vessel or various things. The Mayflower would return, uh, but the Speedwell was supposed to stay. So the two ships set, you know, set out and pretty soon the Speedwell started taking on water. So they both returned back to Plymouth, England uh, to repair the Speedwell. They made the repairs. They set out again and once again the speedwell started taking on water. And I don't know if they set out a third time and then decided to, for the speedwell. I think they just set out together twice and then it was becoming too late in the season for the Mayflower to wait any longer. And so they said, we're just gonna have to go without you because it would take two months to cross um, the ocean at that time. So there was some, you know, reconfiguring of who is gonna be on the Mayflower. Some people just said, forget it, I'm not gonna go. And some people from the Speedwell came onto the Mayflower. And supposedly, William Bassett was one of the ones on the Speedwell who decided to wait a year, or maybe there wasn't room on the Mayflower, whatever. But he did not go on the Mayflower, but he did go on the Fortune in 1621, arriving uh, like a couple of weeks after that first Thanksgiving. So it was a, you know almost exactly a year after the Mayflower had arrived the fortune arrived along with William Bassett. So William Bassett and his wife had a number of, of children, including uh, a daughter, Elizabeth, who has the distinction of being the first person in Plymouth Colony to obtain a divorce. Uh, there were previous divorces in the colonies, like in Massachusetts Bay Colony, which was Boston, which founded 10 years after Plymouth Colony. But Elizabeth was the first one to get a divorce in Plymouth Colony. And the way that worked, her husband was cheating on her with this other woman and he and the other woman were publicly flogged and then banished. They, they left for Rhode Island and got married to each other where Elizabeth stayed in Plymouth Colony. Um, she got her widow's portion in the, as a divorce settlement, which meant she got a third of her husband's property as part of the divorce, and she was not allowed to remarry until her ex-husband died, whereas he had just gone somewhere else and married um, his girlfriend. She, she was not allowed that luxury. <laughs> so that was the very first divorce in the Bassett family, but it would not be the last. So what I had noticed was that my fourth great-grandparents James um, Bassett and his wife had come to Minnesota Territory in the 1850s and um, you know I had tracked all of them and I had noticed that there were two other men with the Bassett surname that were living in the same township in the same county and both of them had the same first initial so that's pro 
part of the reason I was really at first looking at them because I was trying to distinguish James from these other two J Bassets. One of them ended up being John A. Bassett and the third one was Joshua B. Bassett. So it, John was the brother of my fourth great grandfather and then Joshua was the son of John. So as I started, you know, wanting to know more about all of the siblings, I I don't, you know, who is, who is John's wife? He must be a widower, but he didn't get remarried, which is unusual. Usually, especially these farmer types, they get married right away. But they were in a new territory. Maybe there weren't any widows available at his age. Obviously, he had been married before because he had a son. So, so I started looking uh, harder at it. And finally, what I did was I noticed that Joshua's death record listed his mother's maiden name. So then I knew his mother was Eunice Bacchus Bassett. And as soon as I put her in on the tree, I started getting all of these hints. And what I discovered was, was, was that Joshua's mother and his two sisters were still living in, uh, in New York while his dad was in, well, he and his dad were in um, Minnesota. I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> so, so I started looking at these women a little bit more closely to, to figure out, you know, looking at the census records and figuring out more about them. What was fascinating to me was that in the 1860 census, Eunice uh, was the head of household because she wasn't living with her husband and she had an occupation listed and it was milliner, which is a hat maker. Now that is not an, was not an uncommon occupation for a woman to have when she was actually listed with an occupation. Married women, even if they had an occupation, they were earning money doing something, they very rarely were listed as having an occupation uh, for various reasons. But, um, so that wasn't unusual. But Marsha was listed as a printer. I had never seen a woman with that occupation before and I thought that was really interesting. And then the, the last one was Fidelia, which is the youngest of the three Bassett siblings. And she was a school teacher. Again, fairly common occupation for an unmarried woman. Lots of school teachers on my family tree. So that, well, that's, that's pretty interesting. I'm going to um, go back a little, you know, go back in time a little bit. So I looked at the uh, and, and in, 18, in 18, and I knew it was the right family because in the 1860 census, Eunice and her two daughters are listed on the census and then right under there is Joshua and his wife. Um, so they were still living, he was still living um, in Ohio by that time near his mother and sisters. So I knew, I knew that that was the right family. So I decided to go back 10 years to 1850 and see if I could find Eunice and the girls. And what I found was that the oldest daughter, Marcia, was married in 1850 to a man named Orson Colgrove. She was only 18 years old herself, and Orson was a peddler. Um, and in the household was uh, Marcia's mother, Eunice, and her sister, Fidelia, were enumerated in the household as well. And I thought, well, that's interesting that she was married in 1850 in New York, but in 1860, her husband is not in the household and she ha is using her maiden name. I wonder what happened because if she had been widowed, normally she'd still be using her married name. But on the other hand, sometimes when people are all living together, the enumerator would just give everybody the same surname. So I didn't know what, hap what happened to Orson. So I thought, well, I'm gonna look him up. Well, it turns out that in 1860, Orson was in the New York State Penitentiary serving time for fraud, <laughs> serving a sentence of four and a half years in length, uh, having been convicted in like 1857, 58, somewhere around there. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I wonder if Marsha got divorced. Um, Eunice, uh, Marsha's parents weren't living together, uh, 
and I thought, I wonder if she got divorced. And I, and I thought, well, this crime occurred when they were living in New York. So if she got divorced, maybe she got divorced in New York. It was really hard to get a divorce in New York at the time. It's a lot easier to get an annulment. You know, I wrote to some of the archives there and tried to try to see how I would find this record. Didn't get anywhere. It's really hard to find anything in New York. So I kind of put it to the side. And then recently I found a couple of newspaper articles in Ohio papers. And what Marsha did in 1859 was that she petitioned um, the county court where she lived in Ohio. She petitioned them for a divorce from her husband on the grounds that he was in prison on fraud charges. And also in the petition, she was asking to have her maiden name returned to her. Divorce laws varied state by state. And some states were known as divorce mills. It'd be pretty easy just to go establish residency for 30 days and you could get yourself a divorce. And other states made it, it was not legal to get a divorce at all. And then, it, but in most states it was, it was, you had to jump through, through a few hoops. There was nothing, there was no no fault divorce. Like you had to prove that you'd been abandoned for a year or that um, there was some adultery. Some states, if, if your spouse had been committed to an insane asylum, you could get a divorce. So men who had control over their women's, of their wives' lives would sometimes have their wives committed so they could get divorced and then marry somebody else. But women obviously couldn't do that to their husbands. And then in some cases, if the spouse had been sentenced to a life uh, in prison, then they could get a divorce. But I think that, that her petition on the grounds that he was serving in a state penitentiary on fraud maybe didn't go over with the courts because several months later, there was an amended petition in the newspaper asking for a divorce based on uh, the grounds that he was um, having affairs with multiple women. Whether or not he was, it's hard to know, but th that seemed like that was the grounds that the court would accept. Um, but she still, as, as part of her petition, was that she wanted her maiden name returned to her. So she did get a divorce from uh, Orson Colgrove and she did have her maiden name returned to her. So uh, Orson, when he got out of prison, it was 1862, a month later, he enlisted in the Union Army, was rapidly promoted. I'm not sure um, like why, I don't know. I don't know how men got promoted at that time. Uh, sometimes I think if there, if there was a certain amount of education, they may have gotten promoted, but he got promoted through the ranks. And I think at one point he got demoted uh, as well but they may not have known that he had served time or maybe they didn't care. He may have been a very smooth talker if he could have committed fraud in, who knows, I don't know. But uh, he, when he got out of the army, he and two of his brothers became carpetbaggers. They went down to North Carolina. One of them became elected to the state Senate in North Carolina and Orson himself uh, managed to get elected sheriff of Jones County, North Carolina, and then was uh, assassinated or ambushed a year later at the side of the road, like shot 20 sometimes. Um, the KKK was suspected of doing it. No charges were ever filed. No one was ever convicted. Um, there were rumors that he was ambushed because of the atrocities that he was committing uh, within the county using his, his power um, as sheriff. Uh, I imagine there is truth on both sides of that story. Like there was nobody innocent in, in that whole thing. But that's what happened to Orson Colgrove. And Marsha Bassett really wanted to <laughs> break ties with him in every way that she could, and she did. So, uh, so that was Orson, but Marsha did go on to marry. And what I've mostly noticed in my tree is that when uh, divorced people remarry, they tend to marry other people who are divorced. So there was a certain amount of stigma uh, to being divorced. Uh, it wasn't as rare as people seem to think that it was, but there still would have been some sort of social stigma. Marcia married a widowed minister who is a prominent leader in a religious 
movement in Ohio and Indiana at the time called the Stone Campbell movement, also called the, I think it was called the Restoration Movement. Um, it's sort of the history behind this, I think currently they're the Disciples of Christ or something. There was, they broke off into three different segments. I'm not clear on all of that, but she was very involved. Um, she was also very involved in this movement. She was very involved in making sure that women's um, took initiative within the church. She did a lot of writing. She published books. She had magazines. She had secular magazines and Christian uh, magazines. And then she wrote books as well. She, she founded a magazine called The American Housewife in 1869. And then she and her husband, Elijah Goodwin, uh, sold the magazine in 1872, I'm trying to get desperately to get a copy of it to see if, um, to see if there were any knitting patterns and I'm just really interested to see wh what was in this magazine at the time. Um, so she, she never had any children. Elijah was quite a bit older and had a whole bunch of kids that were mostly grown um, at, at, at the time he married uh, Marsha. But what I found really interesting about her was she did take his surname when she married him, but she never went by Mrs. Elijah Goodwin, ever. She was always Mrs. M.M.B. Marsha Melissa Bassett Goodwin. Uh, either she just went by the initials or she went by her entire name and she always included this, the name Bassett as part of it. She had her own listing in the city directories. It wasn't that common in like the 1860s for a woman to be listed at all in a city directory unless she was widowed. And then it would say in parentheses, widow of whoever. If women were listed in the city directory, it was as part of the husband's entry. So it would say Goodwin, Elijah, and then whatever his occupation was, wherever he lived. And then it would say, you know, wife, so-and-so, or, you know, whatever her name was. But Marsha had her own listing in the city directory. Separate, separate listing with her name, her occupation, where she worked and uh, where she lived, which really, really unusual. Elijah died before she did. He was, he was older. And after she died, she went to live with her sister, Fidelia, who never married. And Marsha, uh, had Marsha had kidney disease and she was um, like a year or so before she died she wrote up a will and left everything to her sister making it very explicit what decisions her sister had the right to make like making it very clear that her sister could do whatever she wanted after this period of time with any of the any of the funds any of the anything and then after, you know, Fidelia was the, the last uh, one left and she was in Indianapolis for a while and then was also in Ohio. And she, I could find her in newspapers, like there'd be little notices that uh, Miss Fidelia Bassett, the renowned speaker and will be doing a recitation um, at the ladies whatever meeting. And she, so she, she was a, a speaker. She was hired to be a speaker in various places. And then about a year before she died, I found a notice in the paper that said she had petitioned the court to have a legal guardian uh, assigned to her. And I thought, well, why would she do that? And then I realized, okay, she's getting older and she, she may be sick, I didn't know, but she may be thinking about well, what's going to happen as I get sick. And she wanted to make sure that there was, that she had control over who was going to be able to manage her affairs and her, her finances, her property, that it wouldn't get taken over by somebody else that she was not uh, in charge of. So I thought that was, um, I thought that was just, a really fascinating look at these 19th century women and the ways in which they took control over their their own lives. Now, the uh, the other family is again a mother and her two daughters. And these women are the mother in this case is Harriet Hulda Leonard Stone. She married Leander Stone. And I hadn't 
done a lot of research on Harriet, the mother. I had been really focused on her daughters. Again, these are two women who didn't get married and led really interesting lives. But the more I looked uh, at their mother, the more I realized how influential she must have been in their lives and how fascinating she was in her own right. So Harriet was, Harriet Leonard was born in Cortland County, New York. And when she was a teenager, maybe 14, 15, something like that, she and her family moved to Wisconsin territory, like right before it became a state in the 1840, like it became a state in 1848. So they, they moved there right before then. So this is 1848. So a lot of women were not being educated at this point um, and certainly weren't getting a lot of education if they got any. They might have been, especially, and especially when you're in, when you're talking about you're on the frontier, um, there's not a whole lot of depth to what you could be educated in. Um, but Harriet, uh, she went to a private school there in Kenosha, Wisconsin that was actually taught by an older brother. Harriet was the youngest of just a ton of kids. And so her older brother was teaching. And then a man who had just well, uh, graduated from Williams College, his name is John McMinn, and he had just graduated from Williams College, and he came to Kenosha, and he was Harriet's teacher. Uh, she graduated, they considered it a high school. I don't know that they would have called it a high school at that time. It was might have been an academy, or it might have been a secondary education, something like that. Um, but she was taught um, by him. Well, he then went to Racine, set up the public school system in Racine, went to Minnesota, came here to Minnesota and Winona, set up the first uh, normal college, which is a teacher's college here in Minnesota, which is now Winona State University. Then when world, when the Civil War uh, broke out, he went back to, to uh, Wisconsin, enlisted, was a promo, promoted up through the ranks to Colonel. After the Civil War, he began setting up um, state I think he was the state superintendent of schools in Wisconsin after the war. He helped, um, he was on the board of regents of the University of Wisconsin for decades, I believe. Um, he was like super, you know, focused on education. And so was this uh, family that Harriet came from. Harriet became a school teacher herself. And then she married a man named Leander Stone, also a school teacher. And from what I've read in her obituaries, she continued to, the both of them continued to teach after they were married. Now that would have been really unusual for a married woman to teach. So I don't know if it was in private schools. Uh, I'm not really clear on, on how that could happen. And when, when the Civil War broke out, Harriet, um, she was very involved in philanthropy, like, from early, early adulthood, very involved in philanthropy. And as soon as the Civil War broke out, she and another woman organized this um, group in, in Milwaukee uh, that they called the Mitten Society. And the idea was they were going to knit mittens for soldiers. And these were special mittens that had uh, an extra finger. So they were like, so mittens that a soldier could wear and still fire their gun. So I don't know if they called them gun mittens or trigger mittens or soldier's mittens, exactly what they called them. But they were these special mittens and she formed the Mitten Society. Well, she and Le her husband Leander eventually moved down to Chicago. He became a journalist for the Chicago Times, I believe. And he was also a principal at a, a school there that was named is named for him now. And he was on the board of education in Chicago. Again, the family is very interested in education. And Harriet continued her philanthropy work. Well, she and Leander had, I think, six kids. Uh, all of them died uh, in childhood, except for two. Two of their daughters uh, survived to adulthood. Uh, one was Harriet, named after her mother. They called her Hattie. And then the other one was Isabel. These girls were educated uh, at Vassar College and got uh, graduate degrees. Hattie got a master's degree, I believe, in... It may have been in English or history or some, something in the humanities. But Isabel, 
And both of them were teachers at private girls schools on the East Coast. But when Isabel was in her late 20s, she became the first woman to receive a PhD in physics from the University of Chicago. And she did that in 1897. The following year was the first International Congress of Physics, and it was in Paris, France. So there were like 854 men there and two women. The two women were Isabel and Marie Curie. Those are the two women. So this is like the most amazing thing to me. Leander died in 1888. So Harriet and her daughters lived their lives um, very independently from that point onward. Harriet con continued to uh, work in philanthropy. She was on the boards of multiple chari charitable organizations, including being one of the founding members of the Young Women's Christian Association, the YWCA there in Chicago. She was a charter member of the DAR and um, she was friends of the homeless. She was, she did like so many phil philanthropic things. In uh, 1900, she and her daughters took a, a trip to Europe and because I found their, the passport application for them. And the daughters, Hattie and Isabel, uh, returned to Europe. They returned and and um, registered with the American consul in Rome, Italy, because they were going to be opening a school for girls in Italy. And they ran that school for about four years. Uh, in June of 1914, Hattie and Is their mother had died. Hattie and Isabel were returning to the United States possibly for a summer vacation, I'm not really sure. Two weeks after they arrived, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated and then World War I began. So Hattie and Isabel stayed in the United States and they, they reestablished their school in Washington, D.C., uh, which they call it the Mrs. Stones School for Girls. So they continued to teach. The two of them lived together and continued to teach and tutor um, at least until 1940. I have not been able to track down when either of the sisters died exactly. Uh, I assume it was sometime in the in 1940s, but I haven't been able to figure it out. But in 1940, I can find them on the census in Washington, D.C. Hattie is working as a Latin tutor and Isabel is a mathematics tutor. And if, when you look at the page on which they're enumerated, um, they were living in Washington, D.C. And in 1940, they actually listed the education level of every person rather than just asking if you could read or write. They actually wanted to know how many years of schooling they had. So it wouldn't be uncommon for someone to have a fourth grade education or an eighth grade education. Uh, and that would be it. So if you had any high school, that, that was pretty good back in 1940. Um, the entire page, I mean, the lowest amount of education anyone on that census page has was four years of high school. There were people with uh, college, you know, four years of co college, five years of college or more, which would be graduate degree like Isabel and um, her sister Hattie had. Um, there was, you know, somebody working as a copy boy for a newspaper who had a college degree on that page. So it was really fascinating for me to see. But again, these women, they, you know, they were educated, they were well-traveled, uh, they had careers, and they only were able to do that um, maintain that kind of control over their lives because they did choose not to get married, which is, you know, it's unfortunate that was a choice that they had to make, but they were very, very interesting women. And I'm super happy, um, to have, have them on my family tree. So that's it. Um, I'll see you next Friday, unless I see you on Tuesday for Technique Tuesday. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.